You have delved very deeply into the world of spirit and the world of soul. Uh, your book, The Eagle's Quest, was uh, an incredible exploration of uh, shamanistic traditions around the world and how they relate to uh, the world of theoretical physics, which is, of course, your background. Now you've taken a look at the, the great problem of philosophy, the existence and the nature of the soul. And, and you've pointed out that there, there's quite a paradox because ancient philosophers, Plato and Aristotle, for example, as, as well as every spiritual tradition, is very, very concerned with the soul. And yet, modern science operates as if there were no such thing. It's a, it is a, a rather interesting predicament that we have gotten ourselves into, and I blame it all on Henry VIII. <laughs> you do. <laughs> <laughs> he separated church from state, and mm -hmm. that set the precedent for separating spiritual matters from physical matters. Mm -hmm. And so when science uh, developed from the Newtonian picture of the world uh, to the present picture we have, it was natural to leave anything having to do with spirituality out of it. Basically, it, you look at uh, the Baconian notion of how science is supposed to work with experiment, proving this, proving that. And it's, it's very difficult uh, uh, to bring anything spiritual in mm -hmm. because something like the soul or the spirit is not something you can weigh on a scale. Uh, and yet, uh, there is very good reason, uh, at least theoretical reason, why one should really believe that it does exist. As was first brought out by people like Plato and Aristotle. Mm -hmm. And even uh, as far back uh, as the 16th, 17th century with Johannes Kepler. Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of our Western uh, intellectual tradition goes back to Plato and Aristotle. And I think uh, the two of them are quite interesting because they have very different views about the soul. It took me a while to realize that. I ha I had, I'm more of a physicist than a philosopher, so I had to study carefully to see what these two teachers were saying. Uh, Plato really is, in a way, talking about something which I could relate quantum physics to. I think Roger Penrose in his book also uh, would, would agree with uh, the Platonic viewpoint. Now, let me stop you. We better identify who Roger Penrose is. Yes. Uh, Roger Penrose uh, is a physicist and probably one of the brightest physicists uh, around today who's working on the problem of how consciousness relates to modern physics. So uh, Penrose uh, has written a number of books, including Shadows of the Mind. And The Emperor's uh, and New the Emperor's Clothes. And The Emperor's New Clothes, yeah. right. Or Emperor's New Mind. The Emperor's New Mind. Right. And mm -hmm. uh, Penrose is considered to be one of the top theoreticians uh, mm -hmm. dealing with this model. And uh, it's interesting to see that in Scientific American, there was a dialogue having to deal between Penrose and Hawking about who was more realistic and who was more I idealistic mm -hmm. when it comes to questions about the universe itself. So, I mean, yeah. we won't get into that. Now, let's not get into it, but since you mentioned Hawking, we better just say you're referring to Stephen Hawking. Stephen Hawking, Hawking right, who is the author of A Brief History of Time and has been uh, well known, I think, to many people who will be watching the show. So basically, what what we're saying by bringing up these names, which I know is is not the main focus of our discussion, right. but si since they were brought up, what it seems to be that you're saying is that the the leading theoretical physicists today are also still grappling with the problem of the soul. They are definitely grappling with the problem of the soul because they're grappling with the problem of the origin of the universe. And for me, there can't even have been an origin of the universe unless there was some consciousness there to perceive it coming into being. This is a lesson that all physicists eventually are coming to, if not the majority by now, certainly a sizable minority, who believe that consciousness must enter into the mm -hmm. field of physics in a direct way through something called the observer effect. You observe an atomic system, and the atomic system changes from a, a field of possibilities into something that's solid and physical and real and right there in front of your eyes. This is a, this is a fact of physics yeah. that we have to deal with. If the Big Bang, supposedly the thing that Hawking and Penrose are arguing about, occurred out of nothing uh, and produced a material universe, then there had to have been quantum mechanics operating at the moment of the Big Bang. And that, meant, that means there, has to, there had to have been an observer present. And this is where I bring in the whole question of the soul. Now we've gotten to the heart of the, of yes. the matter. You've, you've really laid it out very nicely. The, what is probably the major controversy, the major theoretical problem in uh, science at the, uh, the 20th century and the 21st century, right there. Right. And, and of course, many physicists uh, are still inclined to the 
you know, positivist uh, interpretation, which is to say, let's let's not introduce the soul if we don't need to. If the universe could have somehow created itself without there being purpose or consciousness yes. or or soul or spirit, all the better. Right. Uh, and, and many people cling to that view. Many people cling to it, and even today. And it's surprising because positivism should have been tossed out a long time ago when we recognized the existence of atoms and electrons. No physicist, no one has ever seen an electron or an atom. We see something very fuzzy when we start looking for things mm -hmm. like that, but nobody's ever re actually seen one. Yeah. So it's very difficult to, uh, to, to deal with uh, uh, positivism, I think, rationally. I think positivism, uh, I mean, it, it's a fine theory, well, it's a fine the, philosophy. Let, let's, for the benefit of our right. viewers, define, define positivism. positivism. <laughs> Basically, positivism says that uh, all, the only things we can really talk about rationally are the things that we can sense with our, with our common senses. Mm -hmm. So since we can't sense an electron, a single electron with our common senses, we really shouldn't be able to talk about it. And since we can't sense, we can't rationally hold in our hand the very essence of quantum physics, which is something called the quantum wave function, which is uh, a, a, a mathematical uh, abstract concept, uh, we shouldn't talk about it either. And so we have this, uh, this basic uh, schism, which I mm -hmm. think uh, ties all the way back to the schism between Plato and Aristotle. Plato saying, uh, basically, you can talk about things which are imaginal or ideal uh, and never really see them or touch them, but yet they're very important that we have them mm -hmm. as models or as the basis upon which we build our concepts of, of reality. Uh, on the positive side, we say there is no such yeah. thing as this. Uh, we only can talk about the things we can sense. One might say that Plato was the idealist who, who believed in, in the reality of, a, of an right. invisible world that was even more real than the world of our senses. And That's it. Aristotle took the point of view that, that we have to ground our philosophy on the world of the senses. Yes, and interestingly enough, they both say there's a soul from very different perspectives. Mm -hmm. And I think this is what, uh, what led me, or got me interested in, could modern physics have anything, anything to say about that debate or that argument? And so that's really what got me started. And then I realized that, that what these guys might be doing, the ancient Greeks, was asking what I call, what I consider to be the wrong question. Mm -hmm. The question is, is the soul a thing? Can we prove its existence as an object, which I think is, leads, leads the wrong way? It's not a noun, it's a verb. The soul is a process, and because it's a process, it's, it has consciousness and it's alive. And to understand life and consciousness without a material substrate, that's where a lot of mm -hmm. people have difficulty. They think, well, how can anything be conscious and alive if there's no matter there? So I'm saying, no, there has to be something before even matter appears, according to my understanding of quantum physics. So I don't see any reason why we can't have uh, consciousness and, and aliveness without necessarily having matter.